A few months ago, my dad and I got his first computer running, this old Apple II from 1979. After that video, we started fixing all the little bugs we found, like some of the keys just weren't working. Other parts, like the power supply, needed a rebuild, since this thing's almost 50 years old. And I was hoping to make this video about how we loaded up programs off cassette tapes or how programming worked on it, but every step of the way we ran into some new problem. And that's how it goes sometimes with these old computers. From what my dad tells me, they weren't always reliable even when they were brand new. Yeah, and even a brand new computer needs good data in and out. And getting a good program load off a cassette tape wasn't always easy. And floppy disks weren't without problems either. And data cables, well, they were still sort of experimental themselves. <laughs> so in this video, we're gonna go through the three challenges we've had with this machine, starting with its keyboard. So the first thing that we did was we took the keyboard out of the case, and I was kind of surprised. I like It looks like a mechanical keyboard. It has key switches and key caps, and uh, these are actually the switches from it. Yeah. But uh, I was surprised everything is soldered down, and it's not like a modern keyboard where you can pop the key caps yeah. out. Yeah. Uh, what was the thing that you were testing on these to make sure that they actually worked? Well, you get out your volt ohm meter, simple ohms test to see if when you press the button, you got a closure. And in the case of some switches, depending on the material, you might expect to get a few ohms, not a short. Uh, but I, I got the good, uh, tested the good switches, uh, found some bad ones, and, and then found some more bad ones. And then this and then, was <laughs> this was the maybe the bin. maybe box. Those some are of like, them. It's like once we started, I can see there, there's even some goo coming out of these. Yeah. Um, some of them, it's like they worked sometimes, but not always. Some of them mm -hmm. had switches where you would get. That one's gone. <laughs> you would press in and it would like get stuck sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So some of them refurbished up a little nicer than others. You know, you go and do a little cleaning uh, and they worked great. And others were maybes that we could fix if we really had to, because it's amazing how quickly a batch of used switches uh, you can go through. We had three boxes, good, <laughs> maybe, and not good. Yeah. And it, you took one of these apart completely. And I was surprised yeah. by how it's just like two little pieces of plastic, yeah. and it's like a capacitive yeah, switch. Yeah, it looked like a capacitive switch to me. It was very, very uh, close together, but the, the, the ohm reading would come out. So I'm not sure exactly what that material was, whether it was resistively something, but it, you'd press that button, it would slide down to where that, that contacting point would be, and then you'd get your you know, couple ohms at the most. Uh, it was a good switch. And th this was the first time that both of us had ever used a Heiko FR301 desoldering gun. Yeah, and, uh, gets my thumbs up. That's yeah. a great tool. You, you had been testing it on like a phone handset board or something, I mm -hmm. think from our early family yeah. phone. Yes. And we immediately saw like, wow, we yeah. don't have to like spend all the time wicking and yeah. all the time yeah. getting the solder off and all that. No. So that was kind of cool. And uh, I don't know, how many keys do you think you replaced in total? Probably... 15 maybe, yeah. Yeah, something like that. It was quite a few. We started out like, oh, we need the run key. We needed you. <laughs> and then we found out once we got that and you start typing other things like, oh, this one's intermittent. This one's double stroking. Uh, and we ended up replacing uh, probably a good, you know, 10 or 12. Yeah, it was interesting. I, I noticed that there was one problem that uh, like a key wouldn't work. That's pretty easy to debug. Mm -hmm. But the other problem that some keys, you'd press them and it would do, go two or three times. Yeah. yeah. And you know, apparently these keyboards didn't have debouncing algorithms built yeah. into them. So I'm, I'm guessing like... <laughs> they, they may have, but it's like the debounce for how many milliseconds. Yeah. And when you press those in, if they have a problem of uh, dirt in there or something yeah. or wear and tear on that material, you literally, as it's going down plunging, it could hit and then disconnect and then hit again. And then you let go, it might hit another one. That could be three hits in one mm -hmm. uh, deal. So... Yeah, I mean, I remember that you... You had gone through and tested all the keys, replaced all the mm -hmm. ones that we knew didn't work, and then we did it again, and a couple other keys didn't work. And I think mm -hmm. we finished, like, the X key was the last one that wouldn't work, yeah. so we went back and did it again. Yeah. And uh, we still have one missing key. I forget what that That's key is. That's the repeat. The repeat key. That's when yeah. we decided we don't even know if we want so it, the, but the, it's in there. Well, yeah. Missing key cap. It's yeah, the key cap works. is gone, but yeah. that, that switch actually works, so... Yeah. I might find a way to 3D print one and try to make it look pretty close. Yeah. Or, you know, who knows if I can find one scrounging around the internet somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But it would be nice to have a way to plug in like a USB keyboard because we also aren't 100% sure how much the keyboard is integrated mm -hmm. into the rest of the computer for the data flow. Right. Like if there's a problem on the keyboard and we right. have it plugged in, could yeah. that cause the problem to well, exist? Well, the, the thing is you think about the simple data paths that were there and if the keyboard is spitting out data intermittently without anybody touching it, you could imagine the chaos that would be going on inside the programming stuff. So I would say, you know, getting that 
keyboard maybe out of the picture uh, might be fun to do for five dollars. Yeah. USB keyboards that cost five bucks. Yeah. Well, I, I did find somebody <laughs> has an Arduino library that that might work. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to tweak it a little bit to use USB because they had written it for PS2, and I don't think I have a PS2 keyboard anymore. Yeah. Well, that that uh, HDMI uh, card works great. Yeah. So. Yeah. That that's been perfect. So speaking of things that aren't perfect, though, mm -hmm. the uh, power supply has been an adventure because mm -hmm. you know it, it actually worked out of the box when mm -hmm. we when we turned on the computer, but. Safety with with the old capacitors in it, we were like, you know, this is an important part of the system. We don't mm -hmm. want to blow out a chip or something. Yep. So we decided to recap it, and I bought a kit from Console Five. We used the Heiko FR three hundred one. And was there anything interesting in your recapping journey? Uh, well, it was interesting to work on a power supply for the first time in a lot because we got to the point now where there's power supply replacement is is an easy thing, uh, but. Uh, putting it back together, getting it all done, and it, it was satisfying, right? You had a, this old power supply, it's still all the parts seemed to work. We replaced the caps and it seemed to work. So. Until, <laughs> until until there was a mysterious ticking sound. That's right, which I understand we're not the only ones that have experienced that. Uh-oh, yeah, yeah, see that? That's the power supply. Yeah, turn it off, turn it off, before it goes boom. Yep. Yeah, no, there's something bad in there. Phooey. That was the easy part. Yeah, so, someone had mentioned that they had had that happen before, and it was the protection circuit built in. Mm -hmm. Basically, it, something was overloading, and it would tick, tick, tick. Mm -hmm. And I, I did pull out the thermal camera, and we checked, and there there was like a resistor towards the back that was getting pretty hot. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, where is that? Where is the short circuit happening? Right. We even unplugged the whole PSU from the motherboard mm -hmm. entirely, so it was all independent, and we turned it on, and it was still ticking. So yeah. something inside the power supply was bad, and... Mm -hmm. Maybe it was like we gave it a good capacitor, and now it's like there's too much power to some part that was kind of barely holding on. Yeah, or that input circuit thing that we didn't want to bypass. Could have bypassed it, but yeah. the, but the new uh, PSU was was a great option. Yeah, the, we we bought a Pico RC, I think that's what it's called, and it mm -hmm. uses it's just a tiny tiny power supply that uses mm -hmm. a Pico PSU. Mm -hmm. So you you rely on an external nine volt power supply or twelve volt. Nine volt. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it Remember. might be twelve volt. And you plug that into it, and then it feeds the 5 volt, negative 5, 12, mm -hmm. and ground. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. yep. So we put that together. Well, you put that together. Mm -hmm. you also can, satisfying. Yeah, and so. you got to put on your satisfying glasses. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got to put that on there, and that, was, that always feels good because you can see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite to the point yet where I need them, but I think that I'm getting there. But uh, but you, we put it in, and you also tested it again with your nice little voltmeter, mm -hmm. and made sure that all the, all the oh, rails were good. Is, yeah, it was working great, except for we started getting some weird boot errors, and it mm -hmm. would do things like the sound would kind of get choppy, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So. I remember I, I pulled out the thermal camera because with these older computers, you can see like, oh, that chip is getting hot. Super hot, yeah. But it didn't seem like there was anything too alarming there. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, for the power supply, we just we ditched the original PSU, but I'm holding on to it because it's it seems like we could get that thing working right. if we spend some more time. But Right, and we're seeing the 12 volts, uh, 5 volt plus or minus. We're seeing that in the system in the right places, so it yeah, felt like a one. good. It felt like a good substitution. Yeah. So, at, you know, at this point now, we're debugging the boot issue because we can't mm -hmm. even get it to boot into like AppleSoft Basic mm -hmm. or you know the Basic on the the upgraded ROM card. Mm -hmm. And we've tried everything. We've tried removing everything, putting things back in. And you even went so far, I think you pulled out like every chip, almost yeah, every chip yeah. at this point. Yeah, I think almost every chip was pulled. I didn't put out the processor. And how did you clean them and, and all that? Uh, I used the deoxid with the uh, little applicator, needle applicator on the uh, pins and uh, went in and uh, seeded them and gave them a little wiggle and up and out once or twice and uh, depending on the pins and how they look. But the sockets all looked great. Uh, but we went in out a couple of the pins had the uh, some of the blackish a little oxidation uh, yeah, or a little something. oxidation on it. But and you you did perfect, right? Every yeah. single pin was perfect after yeah. you put them. Oh, not every single pin. <laughs> there might have been one time in my aggressiveness or not aggressiveness. I don't know, but there might have been one time where there was a problem. Yeah, so. and one of the ROMs. <laughs> I think it was E zero. But uh, uh, the other thing that happened as a result of that, I, I I looked up. There's actually a chip pulling tool. That is made specifically for like certain sizes of dual inline pin chips, mm -hmm. and uh, it it squeezes yeah. the chip and pulls it straight up. Yeah, not so it's, fun. It's just, it just does its job. It's yeah. not it's not as exciting as trying to wiggle it out with a little uh, 
to back pull and forth, extractor back and forth. or trying to use a screwdriver a on screwdriver. the side. So after we after we went through and checked all the chips, then it was uh, I I wondered if maybe the clock was bad or something. So mm-hmm. we got at the oscilloscope and yeah. you were looking at a lot of different things and we opened up the red book and mm-hmm. uh, what were some of the clocks that you were looking at? Well, it's cool. There's the 14 megahertz master clock. It's all in the back corner, uh, Up here. right over here. Yeah, the, the the clock system, and then it distributes out and and splits at different chips. Split it out to seven and three, and you know all that stuff for for different purposes, all the way down to one. Um, and the mat, like the memory runs off of one, so you can go to the pins and look, see, am I seeing the clocking coming into this chip? Is it the right uh, frequency? Uh, for the clock and and we did see that and you know I I love looking at like square waves that are square or they have a little bit of ring so I was a little shocked at some of the looks but I don't know if that's the we might need to tweak the probe a little bit or get a little shorter pro I don't know but but it was it was interesting and fun and took me back it's been a long time <laughs> since we troubleshooted anything like that so. yeah but it it seems it like you know you're seeing on the screen some of the different uh, scopes the screens that we saw if someone out there is deeper into Apple II yeah. lore, is this? It seems like it's okay because you're yeah. getting a rising edge, and yeah. it's more than five volts or six volts, whatever it needs to be for for the that clock purpose. It all followed the spec, like you said. They weren't square; they were more like mountain range waves. Well, and that could be the probe <laughs> adjustment and whatever, but yeah. it's a little noisier than I expected. Uh, but if anybody does, I went on uh, memory pins to look, and you can see activity going on on the different mm-hmm. register pins. Um, the, the question is, should they be more quiet or not? That's what I don't know because we didn't do that before when we had it almost working. Uh, but if are they too too noisy, too quiet? And everything that we've been doing, I've been posting on GitHub some issues, mm-hmm. all the different things that we're testing and all the different pictures and things that are helpful for references, mostly because I forget this stuff and mm-hmm. you might forget some of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's good to have that reference uh, to go back to. But a lot of people have said it might be the RAM chip. So one thing that you had done was you looked in the red book, like how do you set the pins correctly yeah. for different 16. banks of RAM? Yeah, mm-hmm. And you had, you had tested without the two... Sets of RAM I on took the bottom. It one, one at a time. I took the banks out, and took the chip out, I ch- you know, and then I I put the jumpers in the sockets where you're supposed to tell it, you know, what's in row E and uh, and I, I did that and I, just to be sure, I tried a couple iterations of it uh, to make sure I understood what was going on. And I think I covered all the possible things, but I never uh, I took out the two banks except for the original memory that came with the unit, I did not remove that. So that's one more thing we could yeah. test there. But mm-hmm. you also were considering, just to rule out the clock uh, issue with yeah. potential noise, yeah. you have a signal generator? I have a signal generator that can generate 14 megahertz square waves. Luckily, that's not and super crazy. It's not like 10 gigahertz. No, but what would be cool is like, how slow could I make that? Because I can go down to one megahertz or so many kilohertz. Like if I could generate a nice square wave and inject it, you know, I pull out one of the chips that uh, the master, where the master chip is that sends out the 14 megahertz to the board. If I plugged in my little pin there at four and a half or five volts, um, would that work? And could I slow it down and actually see the effect at the different chips? And the, or would they all start working? Well, or would it go <laughs> pop? And then, <laughs> and then we have no Apple II anymore. So yeah. that's where you come in. We both think that maybe the problem lies in the RAM, maybe it lies in the clock, not sure. Uh, but those are the things we're going to be debugging next. But have, have you seen any of these issues? <laughs> like, this is an honest question for you. What's crazy is that it felt like we were so close to having this thing running <laughs> like it was like 30, 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. But that boot issue reared its ugly head. And we even had an external data tape loaded into memory, but that was before we had to work in keyboard. So mm-hmm. like you said, we couldn't type the word run mm-hmm. and run the program. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we can get this thing up and running. But thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to see what happens next. And we'll see you again soon.